very very distinguished uh, scholar and one of the leading economists of the country who really needs no introduction and the topic of his uh, lecture today indian economy in the post post covid era is of course very very important we know that uh, despite uh, this uh, uh, epidemic of covid which was once in a 100 year kind of event the indian economy has come out relatively unscathed so in fy21 there was a shrinkage of 7.3% but in the fy22 the indian economy has rebounded very well by an annual growth of 8.7% and of course uh, some of the other important measures like uh, giving free food grains to 80 crores people that has taken care of the extra unemployment and poverty uh, that was created because of the epidemic now of course we have some uh, challenges coming up like uh, very high inflation rise in commodity prices partly because of the ukraine war and some of these things i'm sure that uh, we will be handle uh, able to handle them and we'll come out well so uh, without uh, any further delay now i would uh, welcome uh, uh, professor vivek devroy and i also uh, welcome our uh, director shri sanjeev nandan sahay ji and request him to introduce our speaker and formally welcome him sir professor devroy ravi friends as ravi has said uh, dr vivek devroy does not require any introduction but this is a formality so let me speak a minute or so about him dr vivek devroy is an economist and he studied at the ram krishna mission school at narendrapur he did his college at presidency college kolkata delhi school of economics and finally at the trinity college cambridge in the uk at present he is the chairman of the economic advisory council to the prime minister of india he has made significant contributions to the game theory economic theory my write up says income and social inequalities i said studies on social and income inequalities i wouldn't say that you made a great contribution to income and social inequalities poverty law reforms railway reforms is also an anchor for the fortnightly show itihas on the sansad tv from its inception in january 2015 to june 2019 dr debroy was a member of the niti ayog and he used to look after the power sector also the think tank of the indian government he was awarded the padma shri in 2015 in 2016 he was awarded the lifetime achievement award by us india business summit he has authored edited several books papers and popular articles and has also been a consulting and contributing editor with several newspapers for those of you who do not know he has translated the mahabharat is doing work on puran from sanskrit to english it's quite a herculean task he has done uh, dr ravi mishra has outlined some of the issues which have confronted our country post during the pandemic and post pandemic i leave the floor now to dr devroy and warmly welcome him to the nehru memorial museum and library and we look forward to lecture from him thank you so much thank you mr sahai thank you nehru memorial museum and library in particular ravi mishra for having invited me here to deliver this talk the last time i was in this room was pre covid that was also the middle of the afternoon and i think there were just about 15 people here i'm not very sure what to deduce from that but i think part of the contribution in attracting a relatively large audience here today is not so much the topic or the speaker but the initiatives put in by the director and dr mishra so let me acknowledge that let me also acknowledge the presence i see several friends but in particular let me acknowledge 
the presence of my dear friend Santosh Mehrotra. We are talking about the economy and the agenda roughly is that I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes. After that, there will be an interactive session. I will not call it a question and answer session because you may ask questions to which I do not have the answers. I think the great deal of interest in the topic is partly because of what has happened as a result of COVID. Economists, following the work of a famous economist named Frank Knight, often distinguish between risk and uncertainty. We use the word uncertainty, we use the word risk in a very loose sense, but economists sometimes distinguish between the two. Risk is a situation where you know the probabilities. So if I step out onto the road, on the basis of past data, I at least know what is the probability of my getting run over by a car and I take my decision accordingly. Uncertainty is a situation where I don't even know what those probabilities are. So uncertainty makes life and decision making even more difficult than risk. And the first uncertainty we confronted was uncertainty caused by COVID. COVID was a completely exogenous shock. Throughout the history of plagues and ap epidemics, and I'm using the two words synonymously, the documented history of plagues and epidemics suggests that they always happened because of cross-border movements of labor in whatever form. And it was no different in this particular case. Had hypothetically India been completely insulated, we would not have had COVID. It was an exogenous shock. It caught the entire world unawares. It, called in, it caught India also unawares. The history of the last such epidemic is one that we have forgotten now for understandable reasons, for obvious reasons, that was the Spanish flu more than 1,000, more than 100 years ago. The Spanish flu in that day and age has been studied subsequently. And the general story is that beyond the immediate mortality, something like a plague or an epidemic leaves consequences that extend to even those who survive. And the moral is no different for all of us who are assembled here. All of us have lost our near and dear ones in the course of the pandemic. But the consequences of the pandemic will continue for a while. Perhaps not in terms of mortality, perhaps in terms of morbidity, perhaps in terms of the consequences it has left on health, perhaps in terms of the consequences it has left on education. The next point to note is no sooner had we handled that uncertainty caused by COVID, we confront another uncertainty as a result of the geopolitical tensions centered around Russia and Ukraine. Uncertainty does various things to people. One of the things it does is when there is uncertainty, you do not tend to spend. This affects consumers, 
all of consumption expenditure is not discretionary. Some expenditure is non-discretionary, regardless of what happens, you need to spend. But to the extent consumption expenditure is discretionary, you tend to postpone it. If I'm going to talk about investments, to the extent I can postpone investment decisions, I postpone them. So the moment I have uncertainty, such decisions tend to be postponed. And this is a point I will come back to later. I think Ravi Mishra mentioned that India has performed relatively well compared to many other countries. Whenever a clever thing is quoted and you don't really know who said it, if it is in the area of literature, it's invariably attributed to Oscar Wilde. In the area of economics, if it's a clever thing and you don't know who said it, it's invariably attributed to John Maynard Keynes. And an anecdotal story about Keynes, with no evidence whatsoever that he ever said it, is that Lord Keynes was once asked, how is your wife? And he responded, compared to whose wife? So many issues are indeed relative and compared to the dire prognosis made by several people around the globe, India has handled the COVID pandemic rather well, exceedingly well. Whatever be the metric you use, especially if you normalize for population, if not geographical area, regardless of the metric you use, India has performed far, far better than many of the so-called advanced and developed countries. Compared to many of these other countries, India's vaccination record is phenomenal. You need to only compare the kind of vaccination certificate we get and compare it with the vaccination certificates that are issued by some of the relatively advanced countries. As a result of which, someone on social media has coined an expression for these countries, namely, they are digitally less developed countries. If I look at the performance of the economy also, India has performed relatively better despite the pandemic and despite the tensions around Russia, Ukraine. I'm not going to, despite being the chairman of the Economic Advisory Council, I'm not going to burden you with unnecessary figures, nor am I going to burden you with PPTs and dashboards. The fact of the matter is, last year, the real GDP growth rate in India was 8.7%. You might argue that 8.7% is misleading because any growth rate is expressed as a function of whatever was the base the year before. And if the year before there was a decline in GDP, the base correspondingly was lower. So it's not very surprising that I should have a rate of growth of 8.7%. So the more pertinent question to ask, is how are we likely to do this particular year when the so-called base effect wears off a little bit? And in so far as this is concerned, there are estimates from within the government, there are estimates which are from outside the government. Whichever figure you look at, the range of real growth rates this year is between 7% to 7.5%, <coughs> which is not that bad. 
This here also has a little bit of the base effect because the con con contact intensive service sectors are recovering this year. The moot question to ask is how is India going to perform? Let's say from the year after that. Let me mention quickly a side issue, which is the issue of poverty and employment, oblique unemployment. A lot of people have written about poverty. A lot of people have written about unemployment and, unemploy and employment. The fact of the matter is, that we do not have any satisfactory basis to compute poverty numbers after 2011-12. Yes, there are people who have made estimations, including Santosha, including some of my ex-colleagues, but all of those involve assumptions. Think of it in the following sense. I have a poverty line, however defined, we can have very complicated discussions about what should be the poverty line. I have a poverty line, and whenever there is an exogenous shock, maybe in the form of medical costs, people who are just above the poverty line will drop below the poverty line. But simultaneously, when there is growth, who are the people who move above the poverty line? Conceptually, as well as empirically from other countries, the moment there is growth, the people who move just above the poverty line are people who are just below the poverty line. In other words, even if there were to be an exogenous shock, once growth recovers, then the poverty ratio should also begin to decline. In exactly the same way, once there is growth, employment number should also begin to improve, notwithstanding the fact that down the years in India, growth is not as employment elastic as it used to be. Namely, 20 years ago, the number of jobs as I got as a result of growth is not the number of jobs I'm getting now. This is not a new phenomenon in the last eight years. This is a phenomenon that has been going on for decades now. Having said that, the bottom line therefore is, what do we need to ensure that India has high rates of real GDP growth? That's really the question to ask. And also as a side issue, let me mention this target on which the chief economic advisor has also recently spoken, which is the five trillion US dollar target, a GDP target of five trillion US dollars. Whenever I have a target, especially if it's a target that is expressed in US dollars, it is a function not just of real growth, it is also a function of inflation. And it's also a function of the exchange rate. If the exchange rate depreciates, if the exchange rate of the rupee depreciates vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, it will be a little bit more difficult to get to that target. If the exchange rate of the rupee vis-a-vis -vis the dollar appreciates, it will be a little bit easier to get to the target. If one is doing forecasts, the easiest thing to assume is that the exchange rate is what it is today. If you assume that the exchange rate is what it is today, no one will take you seriously because everyone believes that you should have a model which will actually forecast what the exchange rate should be in the future. Believe me, no economist has been able to forecast it correctly. Otherwise, they would all be making money and not building models. 
it's a little bit like a goalkeeper who's facing a penalty kick in a sense there is a one third probability of the person taking a shot either to the left or to the right or in the center so the goalkeeper might as well stand in the center but he will never see a goalkeeper standing in the center because he will be perceived to be stupid so he will either jump to the left or jump to the right regardless of the fact that the probability is one third in any case anyway that was beside the point the point being that if i assume the exchange rate is what it is today and i assume some inflation rate then it transpires that depending on what real rate of growth i assume i will get to that 5 trillion target in 2026 or 2027 or 2028 so we still come back to the question of real rate of growth and what do i need to ensure that real rate of growth happens much more important than this is the issue of the sdgs the sustainable development goals because growth is not an end in itself it is a means to an end the world as a whole has a target for sdgs for 2030 and obviously we are slipping because we have lost two years of the development trajectory because of covid again in passing india has performed relatively better than many other countries in terms of sdgs nonetheless there is that target coming back to growth what ensures that we grow, get growth of 7% 7 and a half percent 8 percent leading up to 2030 leading up to 2047 we are in the 75th year of independence we are talking about amrit kal which sets the template for the indian development trajectory for the next 25 years so the fundamental question is in the next 25 years what do we need to do to get high rates of growth and remember that as a country moves higher up the development ladder it gets more and more difficult to get higher and higher rates of growth meaning that if in the first 5 years i get a real, real rate of growth of 8% subsequently it will slow down to 7 and a half subsequently it will slow down 7% because though growth has that exponential function it is also fact that as one moves up it becomes a little bit more difficult to replicate that kind of rate of growth to answer the question about the rate of growth there are different ways one can slice it and these are all equivalent ways but these are different ways of slicing that rate of growth one way to slice that rate of growth is in terms of the four major components that drive national income and that drive growth in national income which is consumption investments government expenditure and net exports these almost tautologically are the four sources of growth so if i want to get growth what can i possibly do about consumption what can i possibly do about investment what can i do possibly about government expenditure and what can i do possibly about net exports net exports and the indian net export story has been fairly decent in the last few months so far as net exports is concerned there are just three things that determine net exports the first is the demand side and what is happening globally partly because of tensions partly because of protectionist measures partly because wto is in limbo the demand side is not as rosy as it might have been There was a period in the past when India, for four successive years, got real rates of GDP growth of nine percent. But those were years when the external environment was relatively benign. Today, the external environment is relatively malign, at least so far as the demand part of it is concerned. And it is because the external world is somewhat malign. I personally think it would be unrealistic to expect. real rates of growth of 9% or thereabouts because you cannot possibly get that kind of rate of growth unless exports do really well but i was about to say that exports depend on three sets of circumstances 
One is, of course, the demand side. The second is the exchange rate. When I'm talking about the exchange rate, do remember it is not the exchange rate just vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar. It is exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis competing currencies. And do remember that there is an issue of inflation rate differential suggesting that for competitiveness, the exchange rate India's the rupee should depreciate. And it's not actually depreciating because of capital inflows. So therefore, any central bank, including the Reserve Bank, needs to cushion depreciation against volatility. And whatever be the form of intervention, it has costs. The third aspect that determines successful export performance is, of course, what you can do on the supply side and the government has introduced several measures of simplification part of ease of doing business which is in the nature of customs at the border or border measures but there are a whole lot of things that need to be done internally in terms of transport in terms of logistics which transcend the narrow border focus consumption investments i've already spoken about consumption investments tend to recover with a time lag and there is already depends a little bit on the sector there is still some excess capacity so once that excess capacity begins to wear down depending on the sector investments are bound to recover the remaining question is a question about government expenditure the issue is not about government expenditure per se, but the form that government expenditure takes. All empirical studies show that the multiplier effects of government capital expenditure are more than twice as high as the multiplier effects of revenue expenditure. Prime examples of revenue expenditure also being the food and fertilizer subsidy. So the question to ask is not merely a question of how do I increase government expenditure, and I will come back to this point again later, but what form that government expenditure takes, capital expenditure, what kind of capital expenditure, if it is union government level capital expenditure, then does it take the form of national highways, does it take the form of railways, does it take the form of items that are in the union government list as per the seventh schedule or am i talking about other kinds of expenditure i said there are different ways to slice that growth objective one is this the second way to slice this objective is to slice it in terms of what any economist traditionally does which is growth comes from four sources there is land there is labor there is capital and the rest is productivity. So to get the growth, I need land markets that are efficient. I need labor markets that are efficient. I need capital markets that are efficient. And the rest of it is productivity. As students of history, we've all studied the Industrial Revolution at some point, And particularly, let's say, the Industrial Revolution in Britain. Much before the Industrial Revolution had happened in Britain, or England certainly, land markets had already been freed up because of the enclosure movement. We are talking about reforming India. There are places in India where the last cadastral surveys date to the 1910s. How can I possibly get efficient land markets? And remember that we have a seven schedule of the constitution. Under the seven schedule of the constitution, land is completely in the state government list. Not very long ago, there was a debate about farmers. Who's a farmer? Regardless of which state you are talking about, the definition varies a little bit from state to state. Regardless of which state you talk about, the definition of a farmer is contingent on the ownership of agricultural land. So if I do not know 
who owns a particular plot of land, then how am I going to get modern land records? How am I going to get modern, uh, more efficient land markets? This has nothing to do with the ownership legislation. That's a different contentious issue. I'm just talking about getting land records straight. We know have the we know we have the technology today to match satellite records with the revenue records to have modern land systems provided we do the surveys and remember I said that the cadastral surveys in some states go back to the 1910s except that the state I come from well I have been in Delhi for years and years now but the state I ostensibly come from namely West Bengal abolished land revenue and no one I'm just not speaking to people who are attending this I'm also speaking to citizens of the country and no one in the country seems to be bothered if I abolish land records if I abolish land revenue realize what it does it freezes land records at a certain point in time so no matter how agitated we get about farmers we don't seem to be bothered that we do not have a satisfactory state of land records in India in all of its different dimensions. So we are trying to get that growth in a complete absence of efficient land markets. The conversion of land on which there's a lot of non-transparency because it is linked to electoral funding comes much later. The ownership of land comes much later. Why can't we have clean land records to start with? The next area is labor. Labor is on the concurrent list of the seventh schedule, which means that the union government can legislate and so can the states. And until recently, there were more than 50 different union government laws on labor. As a result of which, the definition of a workman varied, the definition of wages varied, everything varied. Now, of course, we have four union level codes on four different heads, which is social security, wages, industrial relations, and safety. But we are still waiting for the rules to be announced by the state. And remember, this unification that has been done is only for laws that are, strictly speaking, laws emanating out of the Factories Act. The Shops and Establishment Act, which covers services, is completely a state government list. What we should be talking about is a unified employment code for India which cuts across all of these silos. We keep talking about Bangladesh and the stupendous success of Bangladesh in pushing garment exports. We sometimes tend to forget that Bangladesh had a completely, complify, completely unified employment code in 2006. So that's on the labor side. On the capital side, every economist will tell you that reforms are about competition. Competition requires entry, it requires exit. You cannot have competition with entry, but with no exit. For years and years, there was no exit of capital. There was no exit of promoters until IBC happened. Even after IBC happened, IBC does not function efficiently because it's not just the code, because it also impinges on LCL, NCLT and NCLT. In other words, whenever we are talking about economics, whenever you're talking about markets, we tend to assume that markets function in a vacuum, as if they are mandis. Where I go to a mandi, I buy some palak or whatever it is I'm trying to buy. That's not how markets function. Markets are conceptual structures used by economists. And all markets are embedded in a certain historical, contextual setting. In India's case, that of course happens to be the constitution. And I've already made a mention of the seventh schedule. Markets also function 
against the background of the legal system, which is supposed to punish the malafide and protect the bona fide. We suddenly expect that from May 20, 2014, there will be a magic wand and the prime minister will resolve everything under the sun overnight. We fail to recognize that the executive is only one of the three arms within the government. There is the judiciary, and we don't seem to be bothered about the fact that purely in courts, not the quasi-judicial forums, there are 40 million cases pending. We don't seem to ask that many questions about the functioning of the legislature. And when I say legislature, I don't mean only parliament. I also mean the state governments. Which brings me to the third way of slicing this growth story, which is about the union government and the state governments. I already said that in the absence of the global economy suddenly recovering, I don't really think that we can aspire towards 9% plus real rates of growth, but we should certainly be able to aspire towards 8% plus, perhaps even 8.5% real rates of GDP growth. But that growth does not happen in Delhi. If depends a little bit on the year, but if I take away railways and I take away defense, 95% of national income originates in the states. So whether we get to that 8% or 8.5% or not is an aggregate of how the states function. And of course, different states are at different levels of performance. Their sources of competitiveness come from different sources. For some states, the primary sources of growth will continue to be the land markets, efficient land markets, the efficient labor markets. And in many of these states, and I'm not going to get into rankings, because rankings are very dicey. They aggravate people. Once upon a time, many years ago, I and a colleague used to do annual state of the states ranking for India today. And I discovered that whenever I said half the states are below average, people got very upset. So I changed tactics and began to say half the states are above average, which seemed to make everyone very happy. But the fact of the matter is, that there are several states which are not growing fast enough. And until those states begin to grow, until those states begin to improve their infrastructure, we cannot possibly aspire to get those high rates of growth. In all of this, I have left one issue untouched so far. So let me mention this. There is an issue of the government easing matters, whether it is for business, whether it is for the citizen. And I will not get into details of the various initiatives that have been taken since May 2014 to ease business and to ease what is often called ease of living for the citizens. There are several ways it has been done including use of modern technology, including re reducing the human interface, which tends to increase discretion and rent seeking. But beyond all of this, there is a question. So this is in terms of reducing the unnecessary and malign role of government, which is not just union government, but also state governments. But in addition, there is an issue of providing subsidies to people who need them. One of the things I want to say before the subsidy bit is something that again Ravi Mishra mentioned in passing. I personally think that one of the reasons we have performed, even in terms of human development outcomes, far better than many other countries despite COVID is because of what economic survey a few years ago called basic necessities and the provision of these basic necessities 
which has been validated not just by economic survey but also by something like the national family health survey the fifth version of that i was born in Shillong. Today, I don't have to explain to people where Shillong is. Once upon a time, I had to explain to people where Shillong was. So I'm very familiar with the Northeast. And you have no idea, unless you're familiar with the Northeast, how important the provision of physical connectivity has been, not just economically, but psychologically to the Northeast. For the first time, after seven decades, I have a railway connection in my state. For the first time, after seven decades, I have an airport in my state. But that apart, the physical connectivity, the transport connectivity that has been provided enables the integration of relatively disadvantaged sections into the mainstream of economic activity. And simultaneously, as I said, the social infrastructure kind of measures. So far as the subsidization is concerned, if you go back and read the president's address to parliament in the year 2009, the only way I can identify who are beneficiaries of subsidies is not through a national sample survey, but through a census. That's the only way. The president's address to parliament in 2009, in paragraph 38, it said that in the first 100 days, the government of the day will introduce a census based decentralized identification. Was that done? Of course, it was not done. What we now have is the SECC which has been phenomenally successful in terms of identifying beneficiaries of subsidies that is used by the union government as well as the state government. There are issues of updating the SECC. There are issues of making the SECC on the urban side a little bit more robust. And there are two other issues that I should quickly mention because I don't think they're appreciated sufficiently. One. You will have read a lot of things about DBT, bank accounts, the jam trinity. There is identification based on individuals. Like many of the health schemes, those are based on individuals. Bank accounts are individual based. But there are things that are also household based. MGNREG is household based. So one has to match and map the individual based identification with the household based identification that's easier said than done about half of it was done pre covid covid knocked everything for a six for two years it's resuming now the second kind of identification is on msmes most msmes are not registered under any law so unless you figure out some way of identity for MSMEs, there are only limited things you can do for MSMEs. I have in a nutshell described the template that the government has been pursuing in May 2014 to get the rates of growth. As a final point, and this is the final point, to do these things, the government needs revenue. And when I say government, I mean government across its three layers of union government, state government, and local government. That revenue can come from monetization of assets, or it has to come from taxes. And taxes means either direct taxes, or it means indirect taxes. Indirect taxes, of course, there is the GST, and we all have complaints about the nature of the present GST. The fact of the matter is that when initially GST was postulated, the revenue neutral rate was projected at around 16% to 17%. Today, the average GST rate is about 11.5%. Obviously, this system is not tenable. Exactly similarly, direct taxes, we need a cleanup. 
if you look at the budget papers you will find a statement which says revenue foregone as a result of exemptions all of that revenue foregone amounts to at least 5% of gdp in kautilya's days we paid 1/6 as taxes to the king 1/6 is roughly about 15% 16 16% today the tax gdp ratio is less than that so if we want better infrastructure if we want better defense as citizens we will have to be prepared to pay more as taxes just back of the envelope think of the following we want 6% to be spent on education of gdp public 4% on health all of this is public 6 plus 4 10 we want 10% on infrastructure 10 plus 10 20 we want 3% of defense 20 plus 3 23 our tax gdp ratio is 15% and this is not just about efficiency of government expenditure which is also important whenever we think of government expenditure we tend to think about union government two thirds of public expenditure happens at the level of the states and think for a moment amount about the time of about the kind of attention we pay to the union finance commission and contrast that with the scant regard we have for the state level finance commissions and their recommendations we can have a debate around this room and all of you will think of public goods being goods that are supplied by should be supplied by governments most of these public goods you will be able to think of are supplied by local government not by union government not even by state governments but in our consciousness rarely do we think about devolution within the state to local government so in a sense i've sketched out a template also of reforms of what we need to do to get that aspirational rate of growth of 8% 8.5%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, Professor Dev Roy for that brilliant and very very hopeful lecture on the prospects of uh, the Indian economy and of its resumption of high growth rates in the near future and as you said we are now open to interaction with all the participants. yeah we have a question yeah uh, actually uh, i would like to thank uh, professor devroy can you uh, please introduce yourself ma'am oh yes uh, actually my name is not shown i am a retired professor uh, of calcutta university shopna patacharya uh, uh, i have worked on uh, myanmar extensively and i have been attending your uh, webinar regularly though i have contact i have had the a uh, very rare and excellent uh, opportunity to listen to professor devra once a uh, few years uh, back at university yes, please ask uh, you but now i wanted to uh, bring uh, one uh, uh, request first of all uh, i have immensely enjoyed as always um, your lecture i also regularly read your columns in the indian express i would like to uh, just uh, um, add that uh, like one example that you have given about uh, west bengal i think we are indifferent to many other things but i would like to put across a um, request if uh, the nehru memorial library excellent place would uh, i would like to know more about uh, economic uh, relation uh, 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 of india with neighboring countries especially uh south asian countries all south asian countries included also though it belongs to south east asia myanmar so if it is possible for professor devroy to give one lecture with uh, details all right uh, all right, uh, all right, all right we, uh, because we know yep. uh, we a lot of other countries we and, have got your point and let 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 others have the opportunity to, uh, to okay. interact thank you thank you thank you thank you yes Thank you sir.
Sir, how do you say the global debt impact on Indian economy per se? Or, uh, do, and, uh, uh, love to press talk. How, hmm. how do you see the impact of global debt on Indian economy? And second, global debt, global debt, which is highest since World War II. Uh, that has uh, crossed three trillion uh, now it is and second domestically sir do you see really that things are going to push to create a new economic model because economists and government are pushing us to believe that wpi is higher than the CPI. This is uh, very complex to consume. So, what do you think on that? Okay, okay, take a few. Take a few. Take a few. Take a few. If there is any other question, yes, I had. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I am Mr. Gautam Sen, former retired special secretary. You see, Dr. Debra, I wanted to know, you mentioned about the exit policy. You get into the market. Now, exit policy, this uh, insolvency uh, regulations. Now, basically, a lot of developers have gone into the market. Now, when they get into problems, capital issues plus non-performance, they try to come out. Uh, and then for other perverse reasons also. But what is the government, how they have tackled this? And of late, for about a year or two, I think uh, more or less synchronizing with the COVID period. Uh, there was actually non-functional, this NCLT, NCLT and all that. Now, of course, I, I mean, there is a little bit of a revival. So I wanted your take on that. Okay. Um, I'll treat those as comments. Let me take them in the reverse order. It is a myth to say or to suggest that reforms benefit everyone. They don't. There are vested interests which would prefer the status quo and would oppose the reforms. You're indeed right. Well, you didn't quite use these words, so let me use these words. Errant promoters are very reluctant to exit. The question to ask is given that errant promoters are reluctant to exit, is the EB threat a more serious threat than the threat that existed earlier? Namely, is the stick longer than the earlier stick? I personally believe it is longer. You're absolutely right, and I hinted at that that the functioning of NCLT and NCLAT could have been better. For a while, it was plagued by vacancies. Now the vacancies are out of the way. But my response to NCLT and LCLAT and the functioning of both, I will disguise by saying it is part of the broader melee that plagues our justice delivery system. And NCLT, NCLAT is just a microcosm of that. In terms of what the government plans to do, you'll have to just wait and see. I'm not likely to announce it to the world in terms of a talk here, that it has its own way of being announced. Now, so far as the global debt is concerned, far be it my call to react on debt problems in the rest of the world. Debt has a stock, it also has a flow. What is pertinent in terms of being able to handle debt is not the stock, but the flow. Can you service the debt? Whether it is the domestic debt, or whether it is the external debt, there are no servicing issues for India on either score, which leaves the question 
about WPI and CPI. They are meant to measure two completely different things. So understandably, their trends will be differ, different because the baskets are different, the weights are different, they don't measure the same thing. You mentioned the globe impact of whatever is happening globally. There are several impacts. Some of them I have already indicated indirectly, which is the impact on the real sector. There is an impact which is in terms of higher commodity prices, of which crude is the most obvious one. Although do realize that India's GDP is not as sensitive to oil prices at it, as it used to be in the 70s and the 80s. There the question again boils down to whether I'm able to pay for the crude that I import. The foreign exchange reserves are such that I need not worry on that score. What is much more important is to figure out what do I do about the taxation of petroleum and related products, which is really a decision that only the GST Council can take? And flowing from that, to what extent do I pass on those higher prices in terms of higher consumer prices? But since you asked the question, let me also say that I've talked about growth. What I have not talked about so far is the inflation and the inflation phenomenon is fundamentally an inflation that is driven by higher commodity prices primarily some of it was food inflation which is transient that will pass but beyond that beyond the transient food inflation beyond that an inflation problem in terms of the inflation rate being higher than what it used to be will remain for some time and this kind of inflation is not as amenable to monetary policy instruments as other forms of inflation because this kind of inflation is not primarily demand driven yes we have a question please introduce ourselves sir uh, good afternoon i'm uh, anadinath mishra uh, I am a member in Income Tax Tribunal, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, for last two, three years, the country had a very accommodative interest rate regime. And uh, it was probably expected that there will be good growth in credit uh, offtake. But seems to me that the credit offtake was uh, sluggish. And uh, much of the industry has used this accommodative uh, uh, interest uh, regime to deleverage themselves instead of taking more credit and expanding, maybe uh, adding capacity utilization, going for economies of scale, acquiring foreign uh, companies. I mean, that is what would have been expected. But barring one big business group, which I don't want to name, most of the much of the industry has used it to deleverage. If you look at the balance sheet of uh, companies today, most of the uh, top companies you will see the debt to equity ratio has continuously gone down in the last two three years. So it seems that the uh, kind of animal spirits that we talk about from and we expect from private enterprise seems to be missing. They have. Uh, probably just been satisfied. So can we do something to inspire or maybe motivate or, or make them you, uh, you know, show more enterprise in the business? As, as far as I know, barring one large business group, all the other uh, major business groups have used this period to reduce uh, their, their debt. Ideally, from basic accountancy principles and uh, a debt to equity ratio of between two and three is considered quite healthy. Below two uh, is, uh, shows lack of enterprise on the part of the industry. More than three may be uh, a little risky. Generally, however, for it 
should be for a creditor to decide that i will not i don't want to give you more loan i mean for a business to say i don't want more loan because i have i don't have ambition because i don't want to expand because i don't want to add capacity because i don't want to go for economies of a scale seems there is something lacking in business community sir thank you sir okay most of that is like a comment rather than a question and uh, i will not respond to things that are best le left to the boards of companies to ask questions about assuming they have independent boards two or three things firstly yes it was true that some companies retired more expensive debt and that's a perfectly rational decision to take whenever we are reacting to something that is slightly medium term one should not get too distracted over things that are transitory and by transitory i not only mean covid i also mean the problems nbfcs faced now hopefully we are over that hump of the nbfcs there are issues of corporate governance which let me not again bother about on the interest rate proper again this is not directly linked to your question oblique comment but let me mention this there is a borrowing rate there's a let me put it like this there's a lending rate and there is a deposit rate and uh, we should be clear about which interest rate we mean i'm not reacting to your comment i'm just stating it generally and there is a difference between a nominal rate and a real rate the question to ask is india being a relatively capital scarce country what is likely to be the real rate of interest and the nominal rate should be that plus inflation the question to ask is is the gap between the deposit rate and the lending rate too wide which reflects inefficiencies in the system so far as your direct question is concerned yes credit of take of credit has been an issue but let us also accept that some of investments are now happening not via borrowing from banks they have been happening through internal resources they have been happening also through equity so while i accept the point i'm just saying that don't get completely fixated only on the credit part of it but more fundamentally once there is investment demand obviously credit beyond covid i mentioned the uncertainty already beyond that credit offtake should also improve in general msmes etc that's a separate issue yeah. my name is santosh mehrotra i'm a senior fellow at the nehru memorial uh, library i um, bebek that was a excellent and comprehensive overview uh, for all of us um i have two specific questions related to what you said my first question is about the socio economic and caste census and the second question is about the msmes on the socio economic caste census actually when i was in the planning commission i was very directly associated with its design uh, because i was actually member secretary of uh, the 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 expert group that led to the design of the uh, of the SCCC you you and i know that the SCCC is now quite old it is more than 10 years old and i recall a news item some months ago from the ministry of rural development that there is uh, there is a commitment to hold a new one however the question then the 11 census has also not taken place so 
clearly the national census may well be a priority. How will we find all the people that are needed for the so for doing the SECC as well? In the light of that, given the fact that there is never really been serious ground truthing of the uh, results of the SECC uh, as an alternative to a new SECC, can we possibly consider uh, while the national census goes ahead and we can think about the, an, a new SECC later, at least we can think about identifying beneficiaries better through a, a ground level ground truthing through uh, Ram Sabha. So that's question one. My question of the MSMEs, uh, uh, you, you rightly pointed out uh, that, you know, we don't know how many there are. We have no registration. Uh, and we need to solve that problem because in the country, we have 64 million enterprises uh, in the non-farm sector, including organized and unorganized. I've written extensively on this subject, in fact. Uh, but the, it, the, the, the issue is, is there any thinking going on either in the PMEAC or in the Ministry of uh, MSMEs to see what, you know, what can be done to actually rapidly implement a registration of M M MSMEs? Um, in this context, let me just add a supplement and I'm now closing, uh, which is that an economic census was done in 2019 before COVID. But we haven't still seen the results of that, and it would be really very useful if we could, uh, if those could be released. And I was wondering what was holding back the release of the economic census, which does cover a, a significant number of our enterprises. Thank you very much. Thank you, Santosh. Right at the beginning, I said I will not have answers to all the questions. Rest assured, Santosh, everyone in government reads with a great deal of interest that everything that you write, whether it is on SECC, whether it is on MSME. But what will be done with SECC? What will be done with identification of MSMEs? Those questions you will have to wait for the respective ministries to answer. The simple one point answer to your question, is there any thinking within government? The answer, of course, is yes. But then you will ask me, what is the thinking? And what is the thinking will be answered in due course by the respective ministries, not by me. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Sanjay. Uh, thank you, sir, for this wonderful lecture. My name is Sanjay Kumar. I'm working here as a, a senior research uh, assistant. Uh, sir. Uh, as you talk about this uh, farmer uh, land ownership rights and the distribution of the rights, uh, distribution of the land regarding this. Na? So this is a very uh, major issue uh, in history, the, the, the uh, pre-independence or after independence. So I just want to know this key, uh, this current government is thinking something about this in near future to do this uh, uh, land ownership rights for farmers or uh, distribution of land regarding this government is thinking something like that? Actually, I did not say anything about redistribution or ownership. I just said, even before all of that, let us have clean records and clean titles. All of that comes subsequently. The limited point I made is that we do not have clean records and clean titles, regardless of what we do about ownership and land rights, as you yourself indicated, land rights are actually a bundle of rights. One can unbundle them in different ways without getting into ownership issues, which can be completely contentious. There are also lease markets, tenancy, etc., etc. all of that. My limited point was about cleaning up land records. There is a cleaning up land records, land titles. There is a pilot program that union government has. But if you look at the performance of states on that, you will find that states are not taking adequate interest in that. And one of the points I made earlier 
is governments, whether it is union government or whether it is state governments in an indirect democracy like ours, respond to the will of the people. So I said at some point that I'm also talking to citizens of the country. So as citizens of the country, how many times are we asking questions? That why is not this being done? Land ownership will come much later. And when it comes to land ownership legislation, India is a very heterogeneous country. So the nature of the land also varies. I have states where I have large landholders. I have states where there are large chunks of unirrigated land. And there are areas which are where there are numerous landowners, where there is intensive cropping that goes on. So the nature of the land markets differ. But the fact remains that whatever be the nature of the land, we need to have cleaner records. No, that's it. Let others also participate. Yes? Was that... Uh, you turned off the AC. Was that an indication that the time no, was over? No, no, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Only AC monitoring. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir, for your presentation. I am Smita Tiwari, a fellow at Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. Uh, my question relates to informal sector, particularly uh, migrant laborers who go to other states and work, particularly in undefined sector. So uh, when the news was up that they are returning to their home states and all those, uh, it was read and understood that the government is lacking the data regarding them. So my question is very basic that why are we lacking the data regarding these basic things? Uh, particularly since we have uh, reached digitally to the remote areas, but we are not having the data. So what can be done in this regard? This is the one question. And the second question, it might sound little philosophical. So what lessons can we take from Mahabharata to deal with such situation, particularly overcoming the crisis that we uh, just saw? Thank you. I will ignore the second question. Uh, on the first question, you said you are asking a philosophical question. Let me ask a historical question. I am asking a historical question. There was an Interstate Migrant Workers Act of 1979, which was enacted because of a parliamentary committee report in 1977. It was meant to be enforced by states. States did nothing about enforcing them. So your seniors, when they were doing research here, did they write papers on why states were not implementing it? Had states implemented them, had states implemented it, you would have had a better handle on migrant workers. But that time we did not bother. And we began to bother and our blood pressures went up when there was the crisis of COVID. We did not ask the question when we should. As you no doubt know, there is now a portal with the unorganized sector, and by the way, informal, unorganized, these are used synonymously, but they are different things. They can mean different things, but we'll treat them as synonymous. There's a portal where they can now register, but it cannot be mandatory, so it is voluntary. So I would therefore say that the identification, this is in a sense linked to what Santosh was saying about SECC, the SCCC urban, I said earlier, has never been that robust. So the identification on the urban side has always been weaker, which has made portability of benefits much more difficult because an urban migrant may actually be based in a rural area. So it is still work in progress, but hopefully it will gradually happen. To supplement that for the benefit of uh, Smita, uh, uh, the National Sample Survey Organization of India has just literally yet yesterday released the survey 
which we had authorized in the Standing Committee on Economic Statistics uh, on migration. It's a separate, and it's already up on the website. This was done over the course of the last year. And in addition, on top of that, the Labor Bureau, which as you probably know, is based out of Chandigarh, is doing a separate survey on migration, but that's still work in progress. Seems like we have no uh, further questions, sir. Uh, with your kind permission, uh, two things that I would like to bring to your notice, and maybe uh, if you could uh, respond, sir. The first thing that, uh, and this is very important, Mike uh, and this is very important. Uh, you uh, talked about the important role that dollar exchange rate, dollar ruby exchange rate plays whenever a prediction is made in terms of dollar. And of course, this applies very much to the size of the Indian economy. Now, that takes me back to the year 2003-04. And you would recall that at that time, the dollar rupee exchange rate was something like 1 to 40. And at that time, we had uh, this uh, very hopeful report, uh, the BRICS report coming, I think, in late 2003 or 4, which, uh, as you rightly said, it is difficult to predict. But they had forecast that in the next 20, 30 years, in fact, rupee will appreciate. And the growth model that they had created, it was partly dependent on actual growth and partly on the shift in the exchange rate. But what we have seen is that the reverse has happened. So dollar rupee exchange ratio was 1 to 40. And now, of course, it is much higher than that. Uh, of course, for our export competitiveness and for various other reasons, uh, this is bound to happen. We have higher inflation in our country as compared to many other countries, especially the developed countries. So, I mean, uh, going by this, in terms of uh, what we call uh, the old exchange rate uh, GDP, would it be possible in the foreseeable future for us to catch up? Of course, in PPP terms, we can easily do that. Uh, the second thing that uh, I wanted to uh, sort of raise was, uh, you rightly say, sir, and this has been a concern of the government for decades, that India's tax GDP ratio is relatively low. 15, 16, 17, it varies from year to year, of course. Uh, but one question that comes to my mind is, isn't there a connection between the development level of a society, the per capita income level of a society, and the tax GDP ratio? So if we look at it from that point of view, would you say that India's tax GDP ratio is really low? So those are the two questions. Yes, sir. Even if I look at the tax GDP ratio, of course, depends on the country we are talking about. The Scandinavian countries, some parts of Europe have far higher tax GDP ratios. Some of Southeast Asian countries also have far higher tax GDP ratios. But even if I look at countries for which I can make comparisons with India, the tax GDP ratio in India should be around between 20 to 22 percent comparing comparable countries and if i add that five and a half percent five percent we would actually be more than 20 percent goldman sachs it is indeed true that the goldman in the goldman sachs report about one third of the increase was because of appreciation in the rupee vis-a-vis -vis the dollar Whenever one talks about the exchange rate, there is a prescriptive element and there is a descriptive element. Prescriptive is what you would prescribe should happen in a normative kind of way. They base that assumption on the fact that whenever an economy does relatively well, the exchange rate tends to appreciate. But the exchange rate, as I said earlier in my remarks, does not depend only on 
that. It depends on relative rates of inflation. It depends on capital on inflows. So it's much more complicated. So more than the numbers, the question to ask is, was the broader trend of the Goldman Sachs report correct? And that happens because of the power of the exponential function. Even if I assume a conservative real rate of growth, not of eight and a half percent, but about seven and a half percent, because of the exponential nature of what happens, you just have to sit down with your calculator and do it. You'll find that around 2047, 25 years from now, India's per capita income in today's dollars will approach 20,000, not actually touch 20,000, but approach 20,000, somewhere around 17, 13,000, 18,000. The size of the Indian economy will approach 20 trillion US dollars. Now, something like that leads to socio-economic transformations which we are unable to fathom today because that kind of exponential growth completely changes societies. And you just have to cast your minds backwards as to what India was like 25 years ago. And ask yourself, 25 years ago, would you have expected this to happen? You would not. Exactly similarly, because of the exponential nature of the function, India will be completely different. So, so far as that trust of the Goldman Sachs report is concerned, it remains. I see there are no further comments, so we will wrap up this session. Let me thank uh, Dr. Vivek Debroy profusely. Uh, he gave a very wide, uh, you know, broad template. He told us the difference between risk and uncertainty, gave the components of the GDP, picked up each component, analyzed it, looked at the factors of production, the problems there in government, the roles of the state government, the tax to GDP ratio, that most of the expenditure is done at the state and the municipal level, the importance of how the state governments function in bringing up, bringing, uh, improving the welfare of the population, the, the question of exports, the various aspects of exports and imports. I, I have personally benefited a lot from this very, very clear uh, lecture. I, on behalf of NMMN, I do thank you, sir, for this brilliant lecture. Thank you. Yes. I would just request everybody to hold on for a second. I have uh, a couple of announcements to make about uh, lectures in the next month. Uh, we have uh, a lecture on 21st June uh, by Dr. Prakash Kumar, Associate Professor of History and Asian Studies at Pennsylvania State University on Charan Singh and the Green Revolution in Uttar Pradesh. On 27 June, we have another lecture by Dr. Abhishek S. Amar, who is Associate Professor at Hamilton College, New York, USA. He is going to speak on how Buddhism has been constructed and reconstructed in the modern times, in the light of uh, our own requirements by uh, certain uh, people. And then uh, on 1st July 22, we have a lecture by our fellow Dr. Jahira Khatun on the notion of Advaitism in Mandukya Upanishad. And on 19 July 2022, we have a public lecture by our former Atal Bihari Vajpayee fellow on Sri H.T. Devagoda, an underrated Prime Minister. I would request uh, all the, our participants today to uh, try to uh, come for these lectures also. Once again. I'm actually speaking also in one of these next month. Okay. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you very much. Okay, then. Sir, sir. Good to see you here.